so much, Professor Jiang, for that uh, nice introduction. I'm very grateful for uh, the invitation to uh, present my book at the uh, Rutgers Center for Chinese Studies. Uh, also, thank to Professor Liu uh, for sending me that email uh, weeks ago. I uh, was hoping to make it in person today, but I am teaching uh, in the mornings of Thursdays uh, this semester. And uh, so I, uh, I hope to see you in person maybe at another time. Um, let me start sharing my screen and start talking. Um, this is based on my new book, which came out last year, uh, titled The Rise and Fall of Imperial China, The Social Origins of State Development. I want to start with two stylized facts about Chinese history in the last 2000 years. Uh, the first one is the fate of the Chinese emperors. Um, in various Chinese dynasties, from the first dynasty, the Qin dynasty, to the last dynasty, the Qing dynasty, there were about 400 emperors. And uh, I collected the biographic information of all of the emperors. And then one thing that I paid particular attention to was how they died. Uh, I realized that half of them died peacefully in office, that just died of old age. But then the other half actually died unnaturally. Uh, some of them were killed during wars. Some of them were um, killed by their own sons, uh, unfortunately. But then a fair number of them, actually one fourth of all emperors in China were deposed and then killed by the elites around them. That is, you know, the people uh, working in the palace, uh, those were the officials and then they killed the emperors. About one fourth of all emperors in China died in that way. So, and then the graph you're seeing now is a um, probability that I calculated based on the data I collected among all the emperors. And then the way I do this is I choose 100 year, and then the denominator is the number of all the emperors in that 100 year. And then the enumerator is the number of emperors who are deposed by the elites in that 100 year. So I calculate that probability and then I move one year, I calculate that probability again and then move one year. So it's a moving average of this probability of emperors being deposed by the elites. And you can see in the first half of the Imperial China from the Han Dynasty from year zero to around year 900 or 1000 uh, in the late Tang Dynasty, Chinese emperors became increasingly insecure up to the late Tang Dynasty where almost half of the late Tang emperors were deposed by the elites. But this probability peaked in the late Tang era and then started to very quickly decline in the Song era, you know, starting in the 11th century. You see a very quick decline of the probability of being deposed by the elites uh, in the Song era and then up to, for example, to the Qing dynasty, which is the last dynasty of China, where none of the emperors were deposed by the elites, right? So you see this, you know, as two halves of imperial China. In the first half of imperial China, uh, Chinese emperors were very, very insecure. They can be very easily deposed by the elites, but then their fate changed dramatically in the second half of imperial China. That is from Song to Qing, they became increasingly secure. So that's what happened to the Chinese rulers in the last 2000 years. The second thing I did is I also want to look at the fate of the Chinese state. That is, you know, the, the strength of the Chinese government. And then here I collected all the major policies and also the taxation of all the major dynasties in the last 2000 years. And then based on the estimates, but also on uh, the official histories, also on historians' accounts. And then the graph you are seeing in here, the above, um, is a graph of all the major policies, the major physical policies in all the dynasties in China. And then um, I collected those policies and then I give them a coding based on whether the policy was designed to increase the taxation or maintain the status quo or decrease taxation. So if it's designed to increase taxation, I would give it a positive one. If it's designed to maintain the status quo, I would give it a coding of zero. It was designed to decrease taxation, I would give it a coding of negative one. So you are seeing this line, which is also the moving average of that coding. And you can see again, in the first half of Imperial China, right up until the Song Dynasty, most of the policies on average were designed to increase taxation. And then that peaked in the early Song era, 
and then in the second half of Imperial China, with some exceptions in the early Qing times. But then on average, most of the policies were designed either to maintain the status quo or decrease taxation, right? You see this change. Now, again, this, the two halves of Imperial China. And then this is also reflected in the actual tax amounts the Chinese Imperial government was able to collect. So this is um, the graph here uh, below, which shows the actual per capita taxation uh, based on the estimates from the official histories. And you can see in the first half, in the Tang era, and then up until the Song era, uh, per capita taxation increased dramatically and then peaked in the Northern Song era. This is in the unit of Dan of Rice, which is equivalent to four gallons. Um, so you can see the per capita taxation peaked in the early Northern Song era and then started to decline in the later Song era, the Southern Song. And then although there was a spike in the early Ming times, but in general, you see there's a dramatic decline of per capita taxation in the latter half of Imperial China. In the most part of Ming and Qing dynasties, the Chinese government was able to collect very little taxation from the society, right? um, a very small amount from the whole economy. So if you can combine these two graphs, right, from the first one on the fate of the Chinese emperors, which, you know, really shows in the first half, they were terrible, right? You know, they were suffering from depositions, you know, uh, assassinations from the elites. And then the second half, they became increasingly secure. Uh, this is actually the opposite of the fate of the Chinese government, right? The Chinese government actually had a very good time in the first half. That is, they were able to collect a lot of taxation. They were able to have a large budget, uh, you know, military spending, fiscal policy, so on and so forth. In the first half, they were doing really well, but then their fate changed. There was a reversal of fortune, right, around the year of the 10th century. And then in the second half of Imperial China, they started to be poor, they were not able to collect a lot of taxation and then they didn't have a big budget, right? So that's the puzzle I try to address in this book. That is, I, I try to see why we see the opposition of the fates of the Chinese emperors and then the Chinese government, right? You know, how do we explain why in Chinese history, short-lived rulers govern a strong state while long-lived rulers controlling a weak state, right? Why do we see the, um, the different fates of Chinese rulers and then the governments they were governing. And by answering this question, I also hope to address another question that was always in my mind, you know, as a China scholar, as a Chinese, I always think about how do we explain these two phenomena that were happening at the same time. On the one hand, we know that an absolute monarchy was consolidated in China in the second half of Imperial China from Song to Qing, we increasingly have a very strong ruler, a very strong emperor. But at the same time, the Chinese state declined, right? We now know, you know, what happened at the end of Imperial China with all the invasions, with the domestic rebellions in the early 20th century, the whole imperial system collapsed. So how do we reconcile these two things that are happening at the same time? On the one hand, we have a strong ruler but I, on the other hand, you have a strong, you have a weak state, right? How do we, how do we explain these two things that were happening at the same time? So before I tell you my answer, I want to very briefly uh, review what the existing answers are. There are several popular arguments about imperial China or the politics in imperial China. The first one, uh, originally proposed by Karl Marx, the Asiatic mode of production, but really popularized by Karl Wittfogel in the 1950s in a book called Oriental Despotism, uh, claims that the Chinese state was born as a demand to manage flood and also to manage irrigation, right? So the story goes that uh, 3,000 3, years ago, the Yellow River flooded and then the tribes along the Yellow River in Northern China need to cooperate with each other, need to coordinate, and then they need to have a strong ruler, and then they need to have a centralized government to coordinate the project, for example, to manage the blood, but also to manage the irrigation. And then as the argument goes, as uh, long as the state was formed in that way, it will determine the nature of the Chinese state in the next 3,000 years, right? So the birth, the birth story of the Chinese state was, it was a centralized, bureaucratic, despotic state. And then when it was formed 3,000 years ago, it will determine how the state 
would change in the next 3,000 years. The second argument, which is also very popular, is an argument about political culture. Right? This is the idea that Confucianism or you know, legalism, they emerged about 2,000 years ago during the Warring States period. And then the uh, idea of a hierarchy of obedience to the rulers so on and so forth uh, dictated the nature of the Chinese state for the next 2,000 years. The problem with both theories, right, both the Oriental despotism theory, but also the political culture argument, is that they are very static. That is, they only focus on the origin of the Chinese state. They cannot explain the changes that happened in the next 2,000 or 3,000 years. But as we see in the first two graphs that I show, there were a lot of changes in Chinese history in the last 2,000 years, right? In terms of the fate of the ruler, but also the strength of the Chinese state. Uh, it changed a lot in the last 2,000 years. The third argument, which can explain changes, is a theory uh, 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 favored by historians. For example, um, Skinner, Fairbank, at some point in their career, they all argue about a dynastic cycle. That is, they look at Chinese history as a repetition of dynastic cycles, right? And then the argument goes like this. That is, at the beginning, you often have a benevolent and also strong, charismatic, capable ruler. You know, think about Liu Bang or um, uh, Zhu Yuanzhang, those founders, right? They are very charismatic. They win the war, and then they become the rulers of a new dynasty. And then, um, also, at the beginning of the dynasty, you have very little land inequality because of the war. Uh, land was redistributed to the poor peasants, and then so uh, land ownership was more equal at the beginning of a dynasty. So you have a benevolent, capable ruler at the top, and then you have a harmonious society, basically, in the society, right? And then so that's the start of the dynasty, and then. Uh, toward the middle, you start to have very incapable and also young rulers because you know they need to choose a son, and then the sons are not always very smart, right? And then they uh, sometimes you get a very dumb son, and then the, the the son is very young and also not very smart. And at the same time, land inequality became a problem in the middle of the dynasty. You will have more conflicts in the society. The peasants will hate the landlords, and there will be more mass rebellions, right? And then. Toward the end, the mass rebellions would escalate and then overthrow the old dynasty, which is corrupt, which is you know weak, and then there will be a new dynasty. Right? So, and then this cycle restarts again. So you have this repetition of dynastic cycles in Chinese history. The problem with this argument is also that, as we saw in the first two graphs, we don't see cycles. We don't see actually cycles within the dynasty. We see this quite linear changes, right, um, across dynasties. That is, for example, in terms of the security of the Chinese rulers, we see this um, uh, decrease from Han to Tang and then an increase from Song to Ming, right? And also in terms of taxation, we also don't see cycles within the dynasty. We see this linear change across dynasties. The last literature I want to read, um, touch on is the recent social science work uh, that focus on either the beginning of Imperial China or the end of Imperial China. And then this those works are primarily done by social scientists. You know, for example, political scientist Victoria Hui is, is a very good example, um, or by economic historians. Right, there are a lot of work in recent years done by economic historians, and uh, but the problem is they either focus on the beginning or the end. Right, they focus on the Qin Dynasty, for example. Victoria Hui's work focuses on the uh, the formation of the Chinese state uh, in the Warring State period. Or the end, you know, the, the work done by economic historians all focus on the Qing dynasty, trying to explain why China fell behind, uh, trying to engage with this great divergence debate that um, started by Chinese Pomeranz uh, 20 years ago, right? So, but then the problem is they focus on these two ends. They don't explain what happened in between, but there are a lot of things happened in between. That is focus of my book. So my argument, um, can be very briefly summarized in one sentence. Uh, that is, I argue that in Chinese history, the rulers faced a trade-off that I call the sovereign's dilemma. And the sovereign's dilemma is that um, when the rulers try to achieve two goals, one of the goals is they want to stay in power as long as possible, right? So all rulers want to stay in power as long as possible. Um, they want to have a lot of personal power. 
right? The second goal is they want to have a strong state. That is, they want to have a government that has a lot of money, right? So that, that they can use the government, they can use the state to defend foreign enemies. They can also put down domestic rebellions. But my argument is they cannot do both at the same time, right? They cannot stay in power for a very, very long time and at the same time have a very strong state that has a lot of money, right? And this is the sovereign's dilemma. And then the sovereign's dilemma exists because if you want to stay in power for a long time, you need to have an elite that is fragmented, right? Because if you have a coherent elite, they will be able to take collective action to assassinate you, to rebel against you, right? So you, you cannot have a very coherent elite if you want to stay in power for a very, very long time. But then when you have a fragmented elite, they will also be incapable of taking the collective action to strengthen the state, right? So therefore, the, the type of elite that is required to make the ruler stronger is also the type of elite that will make the state weaker, right? So that's why they cannot do both at the same time. These are two goals they cannot achieve at the same time. This is the sovereign's dilemma that, you know, I argue characterizes the politics of imperial China for the last 2000 years. To elaborate on this argument, I in the book, I argue that um, um, there are two ideal types of elite social structure that I call elite social terrain. And then there are two ideal types. The first ideal type is what I call a star network. It looks like a star, as you see on the slide. Um, there are nodes in the star, you know, the right nodes here. And then uh, there are two central nodes, uh, which represent the central politicians. And then you can imagine them as politicians who work in the national government, right? And in contemporary politics, uh, they can be seen as the Politburo members, for example, or the Central Committee members, right? They are the people who work in the central government. At the same time, you also have those peripheral nodes. Those nodes represent, in my book, the local elite social groups. And then particularly, I refer to local elite families, right? For example, the Liu family, maybe the Huang family, the Li family, right? They're in different geographic locations. You know, some are in the north, some are in the south. And what makes the star network very special is the ways in which those nodes are connected with each other. Uh, so here you can see the central politicians are connected with each other through social ties. And then in the book, I particularly refer to marriage ties. So which means, for example, this central politician's son might be married to this central central politician's daughter. So they are they are, they are tied with each other through um, intermarriages. At the same time, uh, each of the central politicians is also connected with every one of the local social groups in all the geographic locations, right? So for example, this central politician, maybe his second son is married to the daughter from this family. And then his third son might be married to the daughter from this family. And his daughter might be married to the son from this family. So everyone is connected with everyone else in the star network, right? Uh, you have this centrally coherent elite in the national government, but also you have a network that connects the central elites with the local elite families. That's the star network. The second ideal type is what I call a bow tie network. Looks like a bow tie. Um, so here you also have two central nodes, but the central nodes are not connected with each other, right? So the, the central politicians do not have intermarriage ties with each other. At the same time, each of the central politicians is connected with local elite social groups only in one geographic location, right? You know, for example, this central politician is intermarried with local families only in the West. And then this central politician is intermarried with the lo local elite families only in the East. So therefore you have this disconnection in the center, but also the ways in which the central elites connect with the local families are also very geographically concentrated rather than dispersed the case in the star network. So these are two ideal types. And then um, similar with any ideal type, they are far from the reality, the, uh, the reality is often messier, but I think they are very powerful in generating hypotheses that can help me answer the questions that I started with. That, you know, how should we explain the, the fate of the Chinese emperors, but also at the same time, the strengths of the Chinese state? So specifically, I argue that the star network is bad for rulers, but good for the state, right? Um, so the rationale is the following. That is, in the star network, 
when the central elites are connected through marriage ties, they can trust each other, they can coordinate with each other, they can take collective actions when they want to overthrow the ruler, right? For example, if someone comes to me um, to say, you know, let's have a coup, you know, tomorrow to kill the king, uh, in normal circumstances, I would not trust this person, right? But when we are intermarried, for example, my daughter is married to this guy's son, you know, we have this social bond, we have the social trust, we can coordinate, I can trust, and then his promise is credible. For example, what happens afterwards, right? You know, after we kill the king, you know, how do we share power? I would trust him on that promise. So this is how the star network works. This is, you know, can coordinate, can help overcome the collective action problems among the elites. Um, so this is bad news for the ruler, right? Um, but this is great news for the state because for the same reason, right? For the same reason that the elites can coordinate, they can take collective action to make policies to strengthen the central state. At the same time, the central elites embedded in the star network also have an interest in making the state stronger because their family interests are scattered all over the country, right? For example, their second daughter might be in the North, you know, his son is married from someone from the South. Therefore, for them, it just makes sense to say, let's pay taxes to the central government to make the central government stronger so that the central government can protect all our family interests that are scattered all over the country, right? Um, it doesn't really make sense for them to say, let's keep the resources at the local level and have a private militia, for example, to protect our family in the north and then have a private militia to protect ourselves in the south. It's very redundant for them to do this since they have families everywhere. It's just much cheaper for them to make the central state stronger, which can provide this national coverage of all their families that are scattered in the whole empire. So this is great news for the state. The star network can really facilitate collective action among the elites to make policies to strengthen the central state. By contrast, the Bowtie high network is good news for the rulers, but bad news for the state, right? Uh, because when the elites are fragmented in this way, that is, they're not connected with each other, right? Uh, the ruler can really divide and conquer the elites, you know, play one faction against another, right? So, you know, play the, you know, the Western faction against the Eastern faction. And then in this way, the ruler can really strengthen his own power and then consolidate absolute monarchy, right? This is great news for the ruler, but this is bad news for the state because the elites cannot trust each other. They cannot take kind of action to strengthen the state when it comes to, even though, for example, I'll talk about more about this, even though when they face external threats, you know, when you know the barbarians are at the gate, they cannot trust each other to make a kind of action to strengthen the state. But also they don't have an interest in doing so because their families are geographically concentrated in one place. It makes more sense for them to say, Let's keep the resources in this locality, right? Let's keep our families rich and then stop paying taxes to the central state because when we pay taxes to the central government, they might spend the money on the other region, right? They don't want to have this redistribution to the other region that they don't care about. They only care about this one place and then they want to make that one place autonomous from the central state. They also want to keep the resources in their hometown. So this is bad news. The Bowtie Network is bad news for state capacity. So using this very uh, simple framework, I can then explain Chinese history in the last 2000 years. Um, I can imagine the historians in the audience might be scratching their head, right? You know, holding their hair. That's, you know, what, you know, how can you do this, right? So I think um, Winston Churchill at some point, I think was rumored to have said that history is just one damn thing after another, right? So I think the job of social scientists is to impose a theoretical framework on the damn things, right? You know, we, need to, we need to have a framework, a very simplified, very, very simplified, sometimes oversimplified framework to explain what happened in history over a long period of time. That's the goal of this book, right? I don't want to, you know, my goal is not to explain, for example, in this 10 years, in this county, what happened. My goal is to have a bigger picture that can help us understand the broad strokes of Chinese history in the last 2000 years. So the books, um, Structure is the following, right? I start with the earlier period with Han, but really focusing on the Sui and Tang period. And then I spend each chapter on each of the dynasties in uh, from Tang to Qing. So Tang, Song, Ming, Qing. And then um, uh, since today, I don't have, you know, 10 hours. I only have, you know, maybe 20 minutes left. I will focus on uh, these two 
dynasties. One is the Tang dynasty and then the Song dynasty. And also really talk about what happened in between. So in the book, the framework is that I, I argue that the first half of Imperial China can be characterized uh, as a star network. So the elites are very close to a star network. So therefore we should expect to see high state capacity and low ruler survival. That's actually what we saw in the first two graphs of the presentation. And then something happened here. In the second half of Imperial China, I argue that the elites are very close to a bow tie network. So we should expect to see low state capacity and high ruler survival. And then, so in the rest of the talk, I will talk about, you know, the, the end of the star network in the Tang dynasty, what happened in the so-called Tang Song transition, and then talk a little bit about what happened in the early Song era. So a quick note on the data sources I used in this book. I use a variety of data sources, but one of the most important data sources I use is um, Tom epitaphs. Uh, and then the discovery of this data source was an accident. Um, about 15 years ago, when I was still a graduate student at the University of Michigan, I went to the city, uh, city of Xi'an. Uh, this is a old capital, one of the oldest capitals uh, in China. And in downtown Xi'an, there's a museum called Beilin. And then when you go to the museum, you will see the museum has this amazing collection of tombstones from, you know, some of them from more than a thousand years ago, but most of them from hundreds of years ago. And then when I was walking in the museum, I was looking at the tombstones. And then, you know, at one point I paused and then started reading what's on the tombstone. And then I realized that, you know, my eyes just, you know, you can see the sparks in my eyes at the time. Um, uh, it, it's really what we call data right now uh, by social scientists. That is, there are a lot of information on the deceased person on the tombstone. So for example, this is the tombstone of the uh, prime minister, you know, the equivalent position, you know, in the Northern Song Dynasty, Fu Bi, you know, his name is Fu Bi. And then you can see on the front cover of the tombstone, it has the, the position, the owner of this person, and it says Fu Bi here. And then on the back side of the tombstone, it has a long eulogy carved on this, limestone, which survived almost a thousand years, right? And then um, on, in this eulogy, you'll talk about, you know, for example, his upbringing, his hometown, his parents, you know, his civil service exams, and, you know, his ranks, and his positions, his achievements, so on and so forth. But at the end of the eulogy, it will talk about this person's immediate family, right? His wife and his sons and his daughters. So for example, uh, in the three sentences here, it says Fu Bi married the daughter of Yan Shu. So now we know the father-in-law of Fu Bi. And then it says they had three sons, Fu Shaoting, and then, you know, his position in the government, Fu Shaojing and Fu Shaolong. And then they say they had four daughters. The first one married Feng Jing and then Feng Jing's position in the government. So in this, you can see here the transcription. In very little, in very small number of words, this paragraph tells us a lot of information about this person's family, right? You know, his father-in-law, his sons-in-law, his daughters, so on and so forth. And then, so that trip to Xi'an happened 15 years ago. I was working on my first book on China's legal system. So I didn't really pay attention to this. But then when eight years ago, when I started this project, uh, this image of this tomb epitaph, suddenly emerged in my head and then um, uh, reminded me that uh, maybe if I can collect very systematically the data from the tomb epita, but also combined with other sources, you know, genealogies, um, gazetteers, maybe I'm able to construct the kinship networks of the Chinese elites over the last thousands of years or so, right? And then the way I do this is maybe you know, when I can find the tomb epitaph of the Chinese politician, um, maybe I can find some information about his wife, his sons and daughters, and then through his son's tomb epitaph, right, I can also find the, the, the daughters-in-law and also the daughters-in-law's whole family. And also through the sons-in-law's tomb epitaph, I can also construct the kinship network in the sons-in-law's whole family. And then therefore using this snowballing approach, I can gradually build this database of the kin of the key politicians that were in 
different dynasties in China. So that's what I did. And then, you know, I is easier said than done, right? You know, I spent maybe one minute talking about this, but actually it's, you know, I, I spent three years collecting the data from all the sources that I can collect. And then for the, um, uh, the you know, you might wonder, right? You know, why I focus on marriage ties? Because for scholars who study contemporary China, we know that uh, there are all kinds of ways politicians can be connected with each other. For example, you know, the contemporary Chinese politics work focus on, for example, you are from the same hometown or you work in the same Danway, you know, the same unit, or you um, um, uh, go to the same school, right? And then if you satisfy one of the three criteria, you count as, you know, uh, members of one faction. So that, that's the one way a lot of Chinese uh, politics scholars measure factional ties, right? So when I was trying to decide what kind of social ties I want to focus on for imperial China, I deliberately decided to focus on marriage ties for the following two reasons, right? You know, one is the does the folk wisdom that blood is thicker than water, right? We need to focus on something that is more important, right? More important than, for example, simply going to the same school or working in the same place, because I understand, you know, sometimes when you work in the same place, you hate each other, you don't like each other, right? So I want to focus on something that is very meaningful. The second thing is, I want to focus on a type of social tie that can really give those people credible commitment to each other. You know, by credible commitment, it means that, you know, for example, the, the, the example that I use, for example, someone came to me to say, let's kill the king tomorrow, right? I, ha I have to believe in this person. I have to uh, believe that this promise that what happens afterward when we kill the king, you know, we can share the power, for example. We, well, I have to believe in that promise to be able to act on that promise, right? So that's, it, it re requires credible commitments between the politicians. And then as the um, economist Oliver Williamson argues, the only way to have a credible commitment is to exchange hostages, right? This is what he calls mutual hostages as credible commitments. And then when I think about intermarriages, I think about mutual hostages. That is, you know, when I marry my daughter to you, your son, we are exchanging hostages and I'm holding your son, you're holding my daughter, right? So I think uh, I deliberately decided to focus on intermarriages because of this reason. That is, I have to focus on one type of social tie that can facilitate credible commitments among the Chinese elites. So using this methodology, I was able to collect over 4,000 officials in the Tang and Song times. You know, so the book covers other dynasties, but for the presentation, you will see later, uh, I use this database of over 4,000 major officials in the na national government. And then the criteria I use is they have to be national level officials, right? They, they have to work in the central government, but also at the same time, they have to be ministerial level or above. So that is, they, they have to have a high position. And this is very similar to contemporary Chinese politics, that they have, you have to be above the vice ministerial level to be a major official, to be a high ranking official, Gaogan, right? The, the Chinese terminology for this. Uh, and then also the central committee members, right? Are, are all vice ministerial level or above. And then also 4,000 people. Um, and then using the tomb epitaphs, but also the gazetteers, the genealogies, the official histories, I was also able to collect more than 40,000 individuals in those 4,000 officials kinship network, right? They're, they're, you know, their sons-in-law, um, the parents of their sons-in-law, so on and so forth, right? And then um, you can imagine, you know, for Tang and Song times, you know, this is, you know, talking about a thousand years ago, there must be a lot of missingness in the data. That is, I, 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 I was not able to collect everybody in the kinship network. Right? There must be a lot of uh, uh, data missingness in the kinship network. So for the graphs that I will show you later, please understand them as indicative rather than representative. That is, they're not a random sample of their kin. Right? This is the most important people in the kinship network. And also in the book, when I do statistical analysis, I use various statistical methods to deal with the data missing problem. So let's see what happens um, uh, in the Tang Dynasty. So in the Tang Dynasty, as the historians have pointed out, uh, there was a group of aristocratic families, no more than 200 families, um, who were ruling China, who monopolized all the bureaucratic positions in the Sui and Tang times. Uh, which means they basically controlled 
politics, central politics in China, but also they monopolized all the bureaucratic positions in China. So their sons and grandsons just keep getting those positions, right? And then uh, whenever the emperor needs someone, uh, they just draw a son or a grandson from one of those 200 noble families. That's what happened in the Tang times. Also, we know uh, from the historian's works that the 200 families, their male members, you know, the people who work in the national government, they congregated, they all lived in the capital area in Tang China, which was Chang'an and Luoyang. So currently Xi'an and Luoyang. Um, and then that's what also I saw in my data. That is, I saw using the kinship network that data I constructed, uh, I can see how central officials were connected with each other through marriage ties. And then in this graph here, you can see each of the nodes is a central politician. And then they're tied with each other when they have intermarriage. Right? And then you can see everybody was connected with everybody else uh, through marriage ties during the town times. I don't know what happened to this two people, you know, they don't hang out with other people, but for most of the people, right, in the central government, they were connected through a very close knit, close knit marriage tie. At the same time, I can also put their marriage network, their kinship network on a map of the Tang Dynasty, which is what you see here. So here, the bigger nodes are the central politicians. You can see, you know, they are all living in the capital area, uh, Chang'an and Luoyang, but at the same time, through the marriages, they were able to connect with elite families that were located in different geographic locations, right? For example, you know, at the time there were the most famous aristocratic families include, for example, Bolin Cui Shi, which was in Shandong, Taiyuan Wang Shi, for example, in Shanxi, right? So those were those were the um, the aristocratic families with their home bases in different places in China. But then through this marriage tie, the central elites were able to connect with every aristocratic family geographically located in corners of the empire, right? So you see this, and then it looks very similar to the star network that I talk about, right? You see this very close knit, well-connected central network, but also at the same time, the central elites were able to connect with the local families that were geographically dispersed in the whole empire. So this is the Tang Dynasty. So what happened to this star network? <clears throat> the temperature in the northern hemisphere fluctuated, you know, in the last thousands of years. And then I collected the data on temperature anomalies from a paper written by scientists at the Chinese Academy of Sciences. And then you can see here, the graph here uh, shows the temperature anomaly, that is the deviation from the normal temperature in the last 2000 years. So you can see there were some warmer years, uh, there were some colder years, right? And then you can see in the late ninth century, there were some really cold years. And also in the second half of Imperial China, the Ming and Qing dynasties, there were some really cold years. At the same time, I also collected the data on all the conflicts in China in the last 2000 years based on the official history, the so-called 24 histories. Um, and then here you can see in the middle, this is the frequency of mass rebellions in the last 2000 years. You can see there's some ups and downs, right? You know, some years it was a lot of mass rebellions. In some years there were very few. And then also this is the frequency of external wars, you know, wars between China, you know, the, uh, the Han dynasty with the Mongolians, so on and so forth, right? This is the frequency of external wars. So let me just focus on this part of the story. Um, so when you see there were colder years, you see the spikes in mass rebellions, right? And then that makes a lot of sense because in colder years, you tend to have a bad harvest, you tend to have famines, and then peasants were more likely to rebel in those colder years. So you see the correlation between cold, being cold, and then the frequency of mass rebellions. And then what happened in the late ninth century, this is the late Tang era, was there were a fair number of really cold years. And then you also see this spike of mass rebellion in the late ninth century. This spike turned out to be the so-called Huang Chao Uprising. The Huang Chao Uprising was a mass rebellion led by Huang Chao. Huang Chao was a salt merchant. And then Huang Chao was not very happy with the 
the price that the Tang government gave to the uh, salt merchants, because at the time the salt trade was monopolized by the Tang government. And then, you know, he was one of the people who need to get a license and then the fee, need to pay a fee to the Tang government. So he was not very happy with that. And then in 880, he decided to rebel against the Tang dynasty. And then his rebellion was very successful. So in the year of 881, the Huangchao rebels conquered the city of Tang'an, which was the city, the capital city of the Tang dynasty. But also, you know, one year later, they also conquered the city of Luoyang, which means, you know, in that uh, two or three years, they quickly conquered the two capitals of the Tang dynasty. And also, you can see here, from 881 to 883, the Huangchao rebels occupied the city of Chang'an for two years, right? They, they actually stayed in that city for two years. So during the two years of occupation, the Huangchao rebels murdered almost all of the aristocratic families who live in the capital at the time, right? You know, so they, they all live in the capital, but then when the Huangchao rebels came in, they were all slaughtered by the Huangchao rebels. So at the end of the Huangchao rebellion, almost all of the aristocratic families disappeared. Uh, and then that led to the fall of the Tang Dynasty, but also led to a change in Chinese history forever. Um, because starting in the 10th century, starting in the Song Dynasty, uh, there were no nobility in China, right? In, there was this very strong nobility in China for the, you know, from the Han Dynasty, the late Han Dynasty to the Tang Dynasty. But starting in the 10th century, China no longer had an aristocracy. There was no nobility in Chinese politics anymore. So what happened was the Chinese emperor, starting in the Song Dynasty, need to figure out another way to choose bureaucratic talents. And then they turn to rely on the imperial civil service examination system. So we all know that the civil service examination system, the Keju, started in the Sui Dynasty. But during the Sui and Tang times, the Keju was not systematically used by the emperors because the aristocratic families, they basically captured the Keju. And then, so it's only actually in the Song times, the Chinese emperor started to systematically use the Keju to choose bureaucrats. And then the civil service examination systems has a, a strong impact on the nature, but also the social relations oh. of the Chinese elite starting in the uh, 10th century. Oh. This is what the historians call the localist turn of Chinese elites. And then, you know, the works by Robert Hartwell, by Robert Himes, all point to this same conclusion that after the imperial civil service examination system, the Chinese elites became more localized. That is, they, you know, in the, in the Tang times, they used to marry people from all over the country, right? You can, you can be based in Henan, but you marry someone from Fujian. That's very normal in the Tang times. But then in the Song times, you only marry your local neighbors, right? Your sons and daughters only marry the daughters and sons of your local, local neighbors in the same county. The reason for this is because as the exam became more important, education became more important. As education became more important, land holding became more important. This is very similar to contemporary China, right? You can see the you know, wealthy families, middle-class families need to buy a house in a school district to send their children to the school in that school district. So land holding is now tied to education. That started in the Song Dynasty, right? In the Song Dynasty, you need to invest in your uh, son's education. There's um, no school for, for girls, but so you have to focus on the male members of the family. And then you want to hold some land. You want to invest in the land in that locality and then use the income to invest in your son, grandson's education with the hope that they can take the Keju and then become officials, right? So with the land holding, you're also tied to that one locality You because you have property in that one place, you stay in that one place, and then you want to make sure that you have a power base in that one place. So you try to build your social network in that one county rather than, for example, marrying people from far away, which, you know, doesn't really help you consolidate your power in that one county. So this is what happened in the Song times, that is the Chinese elites became localized because of the Keju system, right? And then they, they became interested in marrying only their neighbors rather than people from far away. And this is what we saw in the data as well. That is when they tend to marry locally, although sometimes you know, their sons and grandsons can go to the capital to work, they succeeded in the Keju, they can go to Kaifeng you know, at the time to work. But then when they 
arrive at Tai Kaifeng in Kaifeng, they don't know anybody, right? Because they are from, you know, some of them are from Jiangxi, some of them are from, from Shanxi, and then they don't know each other, right? They all marry locally. So this is what happened to the network of the central elites in the early Song era. That is, you start to see holes in the network. That is, you know, there's still some people who are married, right? But but compared with the Tang network, you see those big holes in the network. That is, a lot of people don't know other people, right? They, they do, they're not married with each other starting in the Song era. At the same time, when we put this kinship network on the map, you can also see it looks very different from the Tang network, right? It doesn't look like a star network anymore. And then, you know, more details later, I will talk about, you also start to see locally concentrated marriage networks. That is, people tend to marry people in their own county rather than people from far away. This is just, you know, a comparison that I put to the Tang network where you can see everybody was, was married with everybody else, right? With the Song network where you start to see a lower density of the network, but also holes in the marriage network among the central elites. I can also use uh, some econometric ways to measure how localized their marriage network was. I will just I will not go into detail for uh, the sake of, uh, of time, but just show this one example. This is you know the the examples of two politicians in the northern Song times, and you can see this is a, a kinship network that I call a very dispersed network because the central politician's hometown is here in Jiangxi province, and then. Um, but his kin are scattered everywhere in the country, right? You know, some from the north, from some west, from the east. And this is a very geographically dispersed network. On the other hand, you see this network that is very geographically concentrated. That is, you know, uh, all his kin are pretty much from nearby provinces, right? And then uh, to tell you the, uh, the story, behind these two graphs, this is the kinship network of Wang Anshi, who was the leader of the so-called Wang reform in the Northern Song Dynasty. And then now it makes sense, right, uh, to think that he is interested in supporting a strong state because his kin are everywhere, right? You know, it just makes more sense for him to say, let's strengthen the central government who can protect all my family members in different places in the Song Dynasty. This is the kinship network of Lu Gongzhu, who is the opposition leader, you know, one of the opposition leaders. And then now you can understand why he opposed the reform because, you know, for him, it doesn't really make sense to strengthen the central government because for him, it makes more sense to say, let's have a private militia in the north, you know, which can protect all my family members in the nearby provinces. I don't need to send my money to the central government, which might spend the, the money on the south, right? So for him, you know, he would um, uh, prefer to oppose the reform and then say, you know, let's send all the resources to the local level. Um, I will skip this. This is just a trend showing the uh, uh, the more localized kinship network from Tang to Song. Um, the consequences of the change were very significant, right? So, you know, in the Tang and Song transition period, that is from Tang to Song, we see this change in the nature, but also the social relations of the Chinese elites, right? Um, so on the one hand, we see in the center, the Chinese elites became fragmented, that they became, you know, from a, the transition from a star network to a bow tie network, they became disconnected. So as they became disconnected, it made it much easier for the Chinese emperor, starting in the Song times, to consolidate monarchical power. That's what we saw actually in the Song times. That is, we know that starting in Northern Song, the Chinese emperors were able to divide and conquer and then consolidate their own power. This became more so in the Ming times. We know, you know what happened to Zhu Yuanzhang and then who you know, abolished the, um, the, um, the Chengxiang, right? the prime minister's office, and then really consolidated his power in his own hands. And then that happened more in the Qing dynasty. So this strengthening of the monarchical power really happened in the Song times when the elites became fragmented. But also on the other hand, when the elites became localized, that is they tend to marry their local neighbors, they also stop having a strong incentive to strengthen the central government. That is starting in the Song times, the, the officials in the Chinese government, when they go to work in the central government, they are not interested in making policies to strengthen the central government because all they want to do is to represent the interests of their own locality, right? They want to divert resources 
to their own locality, to their own families. They're not interested in making policies to strengthen the central government because their families, their whole social relations are concentrated in one place, right? They don't care about the whole country anymore. So we see, you know, that's an answer to the question that I posed at the beginning, right? So, so why do we see these two things at the, uh, happening at the same time, right? On the one hand, this stronger monarchical power, but at the same time, the weaker Chinese state. And then I think the answer lies to lies in the social structure of the Chinese elites, which went through this dramatic change in the Tangsong era. To uh, wrap up, I think my uh, book, the main argument is that uh, I argue the social terrain, right, the structure of the Chinese elites made the Chinese state. So the, the Chinese elites are embedded in certain social structures, and then those social structures will give them the capability, but also the incentives vis-a-vis -vis the state. But at the same time, it doesn't mean that the Chinese state is just passive. Uh, actually, in times of you know, the Tangsung transition, for example, which was made possible by exogenous shocks, right? You know, the temperature changes and also the mass rebellions. When the ruler had a chance, they can also restructure the elite social terrain in its own favor. That is, they can restructure, for example, using the Keju, the Song emperors were able to reshape the structure of the Chinese elites and then to lengthen their own rule and also to consolidate their own power. So that the state can also come back and then restructure the um, social networks of the Chinese elites. But during the normal times, the, the structure of the Chinese elites will shape the Chinese state. So with that, I will uh, stop. And then this is the cover. I will just end with that. I really like this cover. This is the uh, the painting from uh, the Kangxi years when Kangxi had a thousand tour. And then there was a painter who drew the uh, the thousand tour of Kangxi. This is not Deng's thousand tour, but this is you know Kangxi thousand tour, which happened 200 years earlier. Okay, thank you so much. I'll stop here.